I'm just an average guy who loves the outdoors. I love to hunt and I love to fish. Somewhere along the way, I ended up with a video camera in my hand. So now I'm just cruising around checking out cool destinations. So sit back, put your feet up, and come on along. I'm Brian Whitens, and this is where I've been. In the middle of the Upper Peninsula's beautiful Hiawatha National Forest, you'll find a small cabin that belongs to Fred Powers. Fred is the owner and operator of Wilderness Trail Outfitters and specializes in wilderness dog sled adventures through the miles of scenic trails that the Hiawatha has to offer. When I was a kid, I would take a fishing pole, a 22, and a tarp and a sleeping bag. And I would just go off to these different swamp type lakes and I would either eat what I shot or eat what I fished, but I never took no food with me. And uh, just over the years, I guess I predominantly spent any of my spare time in, in a forest somewhere. Last night as I lay sleeping, the snow drifts drifting, the cold wind blowing. I dreamed a mighty river carried me away. When I was 50, my mom decided it was time to say to me, you remember that you never chose this lifestyle. The lifestyle chose you. And I think that she's probably right, because nobody in their right mind would want to live like <laughs> would want to live without electricity or <laughs> without all this stuff. Far away across the frozen tundra. I really do believe my mom. I really do believe her when she said the lifestyle chose you because of I can't explain how miserable I would end up after a year of being st stuck in the economy of one form or fashion. And if anything, two years, and I, and I was done, I was leaving. It was like, man, I just can't take this. Yes, North, I must to find that silver lining. Everybody thinks living off the grid is pretty cool until they see the outhouse. <laughs> Somewhere along the journey of your life, you meet someone who really gets your attention. Someone who grabs a hold of some stashed away part of you and drags it out to the surface. And unconsciously forces you to take a better look at life. A better look at who you are and who you want to be. It's usually not some guy on TV in a four-piece suit with a master's degree in communication. It's just some guy. Somebody that somewhere along the way realized what life should be all about. Hey Clyde, what are you doing, Clyde? Some guy that stepped to the side of the road and said, wow, this is much better. Either way, it's somebody who had the resolution to live the way they want to live. Yes, North, I must. Though I what does it mean to live off the grid? To some, it means solar panels, windmills, and backup generators. To others, it means something more, considerably more. To some, it's not just about not having an electric bill or a heating bill. It's not about survival or doing without the conveniences offered by the modern world, or living green or the size of your footprint. It is about that, but not just that. It's about living life in a way that suits you, not everyone else. It's about self-reliance, and what happens today is up to you, based on the choices you make. It's about where you live and how you live there. You know, I did have a radio, and uh, that shorted out. I just, God, I just hate anything to do with modernism because you got to replace it and you got to spend money. And I would rather not make the money at all and not have it and spend an extra day fishing or driving dogs or sitting down with the dogs just, just to be with them, just to, inter, just to intermingle with them. These guys, you can see really sweet dogs. Gosh, you just got to love them. Mm -hmm. 
just no doubt about it. I've never had everyone that has worked for me has said, I just can't believe that it's, <laughs> you have fun at your job. Yeah, you know, we do meet some interesting people. Gosh, I just, I, like I said, I got power 1,200 feet from the US2 place and I don't want it because I don't want to bill. I just don't. Being totally billless is, uh, I think, the key to stay in here. You know, places, everything's paid for, so it's just a matter of paying the government their taxes. And the only thing that I need power for, though, is for uh, about 60 gallons of water a day, 60 to 100 gallons of water a day for the dogs. You know, I do have I do have the phone bill because of the business, and that's the only reason I didn't have a phone until I started the business. And uh, you know, but I was a news junkie, and I didn't realize that until the government took away uh, analog. Okay, because I, I there is a little TV with a screen about like this. You know, you got to run up to it if you really wanted to look to it. And you had to have a magnifying glass if there was any printing on the screen for words. <laughs> but I could catch the weather, you know, and it didn't take very much power out of the battery bank. And uh, gosh, when they took that away, that took a couple of months to get used to not being able to get the six o'clock, 5.30 buzz, news buzz, you know, 5.30 to seven. But now it's been what, two or three years? since they did that and uh, no actually I end up spending that extra time with the dogs so it even makes the dogs even a little bit better you know. Spike, come on Jammer. Jammer, Jammer, come here, come on. That's a good boy, come here. That's a very really good boy. It must have been 25 years ago when I thought, you know, never before has anybody been able to push a button, turn a knob. Now you don't even have to do that to distract your mind from thinking. And uh, now it's, how do they turn the radio on now? They don't use a knob, right? It's a button that you push. Uh, God, I, I, uh, I just can't even imagine. People get used to noise, which I'm really, you know, I'm used to the quiet. If I, even if I turn the radio, if I were to turn the radio on, it ain't on for very long and I start, well, I want to hear what's going on around me. Because uh, even when I talk to my mom on the phone, I go, oh, you're smoking again, huh? She goes, how do you know that? And I go, well, I heard you just, I, you just lit a cigarette. She goes, how do you know that? And I said, well, didn't you just click the lighter? I go, wasn't that a lighter? Yeah. And I go, well, that's just kind of putting word to the sound that I just heard, and you're smoking again, ain't you? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> you're 82 years old, Bob. Puff away. If <laughs> it doesn't hurt you in 70 years of smoking, I don't think a few more is going to do anything. <laughs> yeah, but. You even hear the earth grumbling. You know, like I was saying, like you said, did you hear about that earthquake? Well, probably felt it, or literally. I mean, you get so used to the quietness that you do hear. There's, there's always a grumble with that shaking. And, uh, yep, no doubt that it's quiet. And it's nice. It's, it's the quietest I ever heard it was after 9-11. And I think they just must have changed their air flight patterns. After 9-11, I mean, it's been all these years, 
and they must have changed the flight so that we didn't have any planes flying overhead anymore. And uh, just this year, I started hearing planes again, so we must have changed some flight patterns or something, I don't know. I don't do a whole lot of hunting. I'd probably be called a meat hunter because I just hunt for the meat. But the fishing, yeah, there's some good fishing here. It's maybe not excellent, but uh, I sure have hooked into some of the biggest uh, inland lake fish that I've ever hooked into. It's, it's all been here in, in the forest. Yeah, you know, it, it, you're never totally free from modern living. You still gotta have gasoline for a car, and you still gotta have gasoline for a plow truck. I got a mile and a half of road that I gotta plow, so. I think, I think for the money that I make, it either goes to the dogs or to the driveway. <laughs> That's yeah. about it, too. I think the greatest thing about not being connected to a grid system, especially when I have a girlfriend, is you can throw all the catalogs away. <laughs> Because they don't want nothing that doesn't run if it doesn't have electricity. <laughs> it did save me an awful lot of money over the years. <laughs> Gave me more time for the dogs. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, this wasn't our first encounter with dog sledding. A year ago, Patty and I spent a day enjoying the wilderness of Ontario behind a team of trusty huskies and enjoyed every minute of it. Even before then, I think back to the first time I actually saw someone on a dog sled. I was cross-country skiing in the woods of the Upper Peninsula when around the bend came a pack of dogs, a sled, and my cousin Rick barking out commands to his trusty team. As I watched the dogs and then the sled pass by my lens, I knew I would someday need to feel the runners beneath my boots and experience the freedom and peacefulness that dog sledding offers. And maybe get even a little taste of the heritage and tradition of something that began in the far northern reaches of the continent some 4,000 years ago. As I mentioned, this was not our first time behind a team of dogs, but this time it would be a bit different. This 28 mile journey would take us through, relatively speaking, my own backyard. We were in Upper Michigan's Hiawatha National Forest, only a couple of hours from where we live. Well, the Hiawatha forest is about 1,600 square miles, so semi-wilderness to wilderness. It's probably the most underutilized national forest in the state, let alone probably in the Midwest. Everybody comes up from Wisconsin, they stay over at uh, in the Ottawa forest area on Tanagan. People come up from lower Michigan, stay over on the east unit of the Hiawatha. And, Nobody really wants it seems to spend that extra hour to two hours of driving to come to the Hiawatha. So it's, it, is, it is amazing that you can cover so much ground in a day and never see nobody. Beautiful forest. Uh, there's nothing, I don't think that there's anything spectacular here, but it's God awesome beautiful trails. Um, Lake Superior at the north end, Lake Michigan at the south end, um, with over 200 lakes in the 1,600 square miles of the forest. So you got plenty of places to go to fish, to, to just hike around. Um, forest Service, I don't know how many trails that they have through the Hiawatha. There's an awful lot of walk trails. Then we've got from whitetails to moose to mountain lions to bobcat to probably every major predator is here. You don't see them very often, but um, 
you definitely see their tracks. And if this forest isn't big enough, then you got this Lake Superior State Forest, which hosts a whole lot of lakes up northeast of uh, Wetmore, Munising area. And spend a lot of time just exploring the Hiawatha. It's like snowshoeing without having to walk. Like cross-country skiing without the uphill. Like snowmobiling without the noise. For the most part, you're standing on a set of runners and letting your team of trusty dogs do the rest. Quietly, peacefully, almost silently cruising through the woods on a trail that you have all to yourself. Just you and your team. Then halfway through the journey, you stop, gather up some wood, build a fire, and have lunch. I was 20 and um, I moved to the Cascade Mountains and I was in the Bitterroot Mountains for a little bit and went over to the Olympic Mountains in Washington and eventually ended up back in Michigan because you sure miss the four seasons if you're raised with it. Carson. No, Carson. I was hunting and trapping for a living. Managed an Ebershon ranch for three years. Pure Marquette Rod and Gun Club, and I managed that for three years. Um, I went from that, and I was a fish farmer, and in between all these and that, I would always end up back in the forest again. I moved to the Hiawatha National Forest. It was a choice, and it was a, a choice to live this kind of lifestyle off the grid, um, more living off the land, although the the dogs make my living. Uh, but back then, um, snowmobiles weren't the thing. Uh, after being broke down one time, and having blisters on the bottom of my feet that were just raw red, <clears throat> the dogs looked more and more interesting, and I was driving a wrecker for a buddy of mine one winter, and I went to a guy's house to grab his car, and he had a 100 Alaskan Huskies, and I thought, that's it. It was just that simple. That's it. And when I left, I left with his car and four puppies, which was the introduction to the Alaskan Husky. And I fell in love with just how these guys think. Um, the social aspect of the living is why we can sit out here in the middle of a wilderness area and have nine male dogs loose and no wars going on. What made me fall in love with dog sledding was the dogs. These big, beautiful dogs, see? Hey, Axel. It's the dog sledding, the forest. I'm in love with the, the forest. These dogs just kind of go along with it. Um, the forest changes every day. You'd think that you'd almost get tired of being on a set of runners. Uh, we don't take the same trails all the time, but when you're, you're the guide, you're seeing the trails all the time. And, uh, but the forest changes every day. Just like uh, when we stopped before and we seen that the uh, coyote had caught a rabbit. And, the process of eating it, or he left something there that a raven found and grabbed it and flew over by the trail. Uh, it's always changing. To mush, or at least to do what Fred does, one must possess two basic loves, dogs and the outdoors. I think Fred's love for the outdoors is surpassed only by his love for the dogs. Last night as I lay sleeping, Snow drifts drifting, the cold wind blowing. I dreamed a mighty river carried me away. 
dogs are not just tools or equipment for the business. Wilderness Trail Outfitters is a partnership. A partnership between Fred and his family of dogs. And they are as friendly as any pet I've ever had. The frozen tundra. I would suggest to anybody who enjoys the outdoors to stop in and visit Fred and the dogs and spend your own day on a sled. It left my soul on the shore of a northern sea. This sort of off-the-grid lifestyle really does make you stop and think about how you live your life and how simple it really should be, or could be, and maybe how little we need the things we say we can't live without. What have I been missing? Why do I never seem to have the time to do all the things that I enjoy doing so much? What on earth is so important that I don't take the time to stop and check out the scenery or smell the air? After all, it's the simple things that dish out the most pleasure. A quiet day on a stream, the warm breeze of a fall day while sitting in a tree stand, listening to the snowfall. These simple pleasures all have one thing in common. They're free. It doesn't matter if you're wealthy or poor. The simple things are always there, waiting for us to enjoy. Though I have left behind me All that I ever had Or so I'm told Living off the grid doesn't necessarily mean you have to live without electricity or eat nothing but venison and fish all year. I think it's more about what you have than what you don't have. For everything you don't have, there is something else there to take its place. Mostly, time. It's really about trading money for time. Less work means less money, but more time. You spend your money on bills, you spend your time on the things you enjoy. We all want freedom and time, but how much are we willing to give up to trade for that freedom and time? I think maybe we could all use a little time off the grid. It just makes for a really nice life. Nice and easy. And you know, how could you not fall in love with a lifestyle like this? It just... Hey, boys. can't bite it, eat it, or chew it, or hump it, then they're going to pee on it and walk away. <laughs> That's just the way they are.